Um, as you just heard, uh, we are excited to meet with all of you in a couple of weeks in Washington, D.C. on December 6th and December 7th at the Biden-Harris administration's third annual Tribal Nations Summit. You know, since we were last together in June up in Minnesota, we've continued our work at the Department of the Interior to usher in this new era of policy or of tribal uh, revitalization. Uh, we've taken a number of steps over the past three years to lay the foundation for this policy in the future to make sure that every single Native person has the ability to live safe, healthy, and fulfilling lives together as tribal people in their tribal homelands. Now, speaking of the future, last week I had a chance to participate in the administration's annual Tribal Youth Summit. And I know that they often bring people like me and other leaders from the government there to inspire young people from across Indian country to think about public service. But I have to say that that event is, as, is more inspiring for us in public service than it is for those young people. And I'm always just so amazed at the talent amongst young people in Indian country today. And I think back to when I was a student uh, applying for jobs and internships, there's no way I would have been competitive with some of the young people in your communities. And uh, it's always inspiring for me, their clear-eyed vision for the future that they're just not going to accept the old ways of doing things anymore and the old answers to the old questions. And that's inspiring for me that makes me feel good to know that our future is in very good hands. So you heard Liz and Rose talk a little bit about some of the things that we've been working on. Uh, they mentioned the Brackeen decision. I have to say as, a, as an Indian law attorney uh, that that may be it may end up being the most consequential Indian law case in my lifetime. And the effort to bring about that victory wasn't just a couple of lawyers at the Department of Justice, and it wasn't just a couple of lawyers for a couple of tribes arguing those cases up through the courts. That is, that case and that legal victory is as good a, an example as I've ever seen of Indian country tribal advocates and federal agencies working together for a shared purpose of protecting our kids, protecting our families, and protecting our sovereignty. And I couldn't be more proud of this shared effort that we undertook together to protect ICWA and keep our kids home, keep our families together, and protect tribal sovereignty. Everybody here knows that for the better part of two centuries, the United States policy was to decide what was best for us as Indian people, to make decisions for us without talking with us, without consulting with us, and even coercing us to take paths that we didn't want to take. One of the ways that the government carried out this policy of deciding what was best for Indian people was through forced assimilation in the boarding school system. Secretary Holland and I recently concluded the Road to Healing Tour throughout Indian country, where we heard directly from survivors and their families about their experiences in the boarding school system. This was some of the most challenging but most meaningful work I've ever done in my life. <laughs> to sit there and listen to elders talk about the worst things that were ever done to them. But it's also very gratifying. I've been inspired by the courage of the people who've come forward to tell their stories and their family stories. And I've been grateful for the shared commitment to move forward in a spirit of healing. And now under Secretary Holland's boarding school initiative, we are working to develop a second volume of our boarding school report. We're working to document 
the legacy of these boarding school policies and to lay out a clear picture painted also with the stories of the people who experienced it, of what this boarding school system is and what our path toward healing should be. I also think that this work has borne fruit already. As I just mentioned, uh, the Brackeen uh, decision uh, by the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court cited our work. And when I say our work, I don't mean the Department of the Interior, I mean our work to highlight and explain the impact of the boarding school system, the Supreme Court cited our work in upholding the Indian Child Welfare Act. In contrast to the harmful policies of the past, this administration is working to fulfill our treaty and trust obligations to tribal nations. And this requires us to work in partnership with one another. We have to work in collaboration with tribal nations, the first sovereigns on this continent, to make life better for indigenous people by protecting tribal sovereignty and revitalizing tribal culture. That's why we've put our money where our mouth is, as you've heard from us countless times and as you heard from Rose and Liz this morning, but it, it's worth saying that words without any action don't mean anything. We've put our money where our mouth is, $45 billion, to back up this commitment. And that's on top of the annual budget increases that you've seen at the Department of the Interior and at IHS. These resources through this, uh, that this money supports uh, includes addressing climate change and bringing basic needs and goods to tribal communities. So for example, in July, we announced the availability of $120 million through the BIA's Tribal Climate Resilience Annual Awards Program. So for a sense of scale, this is perhaps the largest grant solicitation in the history of the BIA. And this funding solicitation just this year is more than the BIA has invested in tribal climate resilience over the past 10 years combined. And that is funding that's available to all of you to help prepare your communities from, against the threats of climate change, whether it's drought, coastal erosion, flooding, wildfire, food shortages, you name it. We've also invested $120 million in a voluntary community relocation program, which we announced last year at the Tribal Nation Summit, to support 11 different communities to either relocate to safer ground or protect in place where they're at from the threats of climate change. And we recently announced the launch of a new tribal electrification program, which will invest $150 million in bringing electricity to homes in Indian country that don't have it. So under this administration and with your work and our partners in Congress, there will be people in Indian country who for the first time ever have electricity in their homes. Something that basic, that people across the country take for granted. We're back, thank you. That's a big deal. In addition to that, we're also supporting policy changes to develop and advance tribal economies and support tribal sovereignty and cultural revitalization, including making the land and the trust process easier. Thank you. You know, the Indian Reorganization Act is almost 100 years old now. And since that law was put into effect, we at the BIA and at the Department of the Interior, we've made it harder and harder and harder to put land into trust. As uh, Chairman Dupi from the Fond du Lac Band uh, said at a, an event I was at with him, said, you, the federal government took tribal lands with the stroke of a pen and now makes us jump through all these hoops just to get a tiny piece of it back. President Biden committed to making the land and the trust process easier. And so we've made some progress to make good on that commitment. Since the start of the Biden-Harris administration, we've been able to put 
nearly 300,000 acres of land in a trust in under three years. So, for comparison, those of you who remember President Obama's administration, we had committed to putting a half million acres of trust of land in the trust over eight years. So we've almost neared, or we're approaching that effort in much less time. We're also working, as you all hear me say all the time, to complete our land in the trust regulations to make sure that this commitment from the president to restore tribal homelands outlives those of us who are working in the federal government today. So since we're in New Orleans, the home of gumbo and jambalaya, uh, I want to wrap up by feeding you all some alphabet soup. Uh, I know that doesn't sound really appealing, but I promise that it's tasty. It's really good. Uh, specifically, I'm talking about the 477 program, the 105L program, and 638. Really exciting acronyms, right? We got to come up with better names for these, but this, I think, highlights some of the transformational work that's underway. Uh, the 477 program is a program that allows tribes uh, with funding through grants and other means from across the federal government to consolidate those grants into a single plan with a single budget and a single report uh, to manage. Now those of you who are tribal administrators or been tribal administrators, those of you who are tribal leaders know how difficult it is to manage all of these grants. Instead of solving problems in your communities, your staff have to report back to us in the federal government uh, on how you're spending funds in your community. The 477 program reduces the burden of tribal administrative reporting and accounting costs and gives tribes the power to integrate and deliver federal services in your communities. Vice President Harris has spoken directly about the promise of 477 here at NCAI in noting that it gives tribes the power to make decisions about how best to integrate and deliver federal services in your communities. And last October, we realized her vision for a renegotiated interagency agreement under this program uh, to make this, pro make this program work as intended by Congress and as intended by you. And we did that, not just amongst federal agencies, but also in partnership with tribes. Tribes were directly involved in this interagency negotiation. So as a mark of how popular and how successful this has been, we now have more than half of the federally recognized tribes in the United States participating in this program and we're excited to bring the rest of you into it and along the way and we want to support your efforts to bring more programs uh, from across the federal government under the umbrella of 477. This program is built on the principle of self-determination. Now at the BIA and at IHS we've got a half a century of experience now with with self-determination. And, and those of you guys who's been around, Chairman Allen, we've talked about this. BIA kind of had to be dragged kicking and screaming uh, to self-determination. But now it's something we do. IHS is the same way. But our partner agencies across the federal government haven't had a half century of experience with this. But through the 477 programs, we're embedding that principle at agencies that have never had to use it so that we're moving away from this notion that tribes, we're gonna grant you money like we grant the community foundations and nonprofits um, and treat you the same. And we're moving away from that toward, we're gonna work with you on a government to government basis. And we, and these other agencies that have never had to use Public Law 638, we're gonna support you in this principle of self-determination where you decide how to spend this money yourself. <laughs> Another tool, another ingredient in this alphabet soup is the 105L leasing program. This isn't a traditional lease like you might have on your home or on an apartment, but it's an agreement between the BIA or IHS and a tribe to reimburse you for facility costs. 
And the best part is that it's mandatory. It's mandatory under Public Law 638. Costs may be reimbursed when a facility is used to carry out programs, functions, services, or activities under a 638 contract or under a self-governance compact. And under this program, we cover the costs of things like rent, depreciation, reserve funds, principal and interest, and operation and maintenance. And this is a tool that can also be used to support construction of new facilities that support the PFSAs that you're already running under 638 contracts in self-governance agreements. And our team would be happy to meet with you to walk through how we do this. And I also want to just note that uh, under this program, President Biden in this year's request to Congress for the budget has asked Congress to make this funding mandatory. And the last bit of, uh, of alphabet soup I want to share with you is 638 itself. As I mentioned, the BIA has been doing this for a long time, but that authority exists also for all agencies at the Department of the Interior. And it's not a muscle that we've really exercised over the years. But at the Department of the Interior, under Secretary Holland's leadership, we've been working to grow the 638 contracting program beyond the BIA. So we've got agreements through the Bureau of Reclamation. We've got agreements with the Fish and Wildlife Service. We're working on agreements with the National Park Service. And we're working to use this as a tool also to support the Secretary's co-management and co-stewardship initiative. So that when you all work with us on co-management projects, that we have 638 contracting as a tool to help support that work. Now this isn't gonna be easy. It's, as I said, it's a new muscle that we're really, or it's a muscle that we're exercising at the department. So we're gonna need your patience, but we're also gonna need your help and your guidance and understanding how this tool can be used to support the work that you do and to grow 638 beyond the BIA. So I think when you take these three things together now and you stir it up in this alphabet soup, public law 477, 105L leasing, 638 contracting across the Department of the Interior. I think you can see the beginning of an important moment in federal tribal relations. A, a change in the mentality of how federal agencies work with tribes to provide funding and resources to tribes. I think that maybe if we keep up this work together. We continue this hard work of changing this mentality that years from now when we look back over these couple of years, that we will see that it was the start of a new era, a start of a new moment in how federal agencies work with tribes. And that funding, not just from BI and not just from IHS, but across the United States, the whole federal government, which has the trust responsibility. The whole United States government has that responsibility. That funding will be based on this principle of self-determination and self-governance instead of just granting money like tribes or some you know, public uh, nonprofit club. That we'll look back on this moment as when the federal government took that next step to meet our trust responsibility by having every agency engage with tribes on a nation-to-nation -nation basis. Thank you. So, that's exciting. It should be. It's not exciting to rattle off acronyms and, and statutory sections, but at the end of the day, revitalizing tribal way of life, supporting that with meaningful investments and changing the mindset of how those investments come down, that's transformation. That's transformational work. And that came about from the President, the Vice President, and Secretary Holland making this commitment. We're gonna continue this commitment. We're gonna continue the hard work to run through the tape at the end of the President's first term. 
And we're going to continue this partnership and really make things better for people in your communities, in our communities, for generations to come. Miigwech for your partnership, miigwech for your support, miigwech for your leadership in your communities. I love working with all of you guys, and I uh, hope you all have safe travels home. I think I can take a couple of questions. You betcha.